Okay, everyone, so here we are the day after the exam. And um, we have a die, we have a very hearty group of people here who are the, our core group. So it'll be fun to teach today to them. And we're going to do chapter 21, which is analysis of variance. So you might think, well, what happened to chapters? We went from 18 to 21. Well, let's go over to the, first of all, let me just tell you what's due. No pre-lectures are due yet, but what I'm going to do is take this chapter 19 and 20 that we're skipping. We went from 18 to 21. These are the power calculations, and they're not going to be on any homework or on any exam, but some people have been asking me about them, and so what I think I'm going to do, I just, I think that it's something I haven't done before, but I have good pre-lectures on them, and so what I can do is uh, have the pre-lectures as uh, pre-lectures on material we don't cover, which means that you can learn, earn extra bonus points. And I'll explain how that will work, but so no one has to do this. It's on material we haven't covered, but if you want to uh, uh, listen to me and Carly talking about the, uh, how to calculate how big a sample size you need to achieve a certain amount of power. So for anybody who's going into research, it would be very, very useful if you're going to be designing experiments. It comes up all the time. And people talk about power all the time. So we do the calculations there, and you can watch those. And I'll send everybody an email about them. So we're skipping over to 21. And this homework is not posted yet. It will only be on the ANOVA, that we, on what we do today. But um, I'll post it uh, tomorrow or later tonight if I can. All right, so let's move on now, and we're going to, and your exam scores, everybody's probably interested, day after exam, um, uh, you'll get those tonight. I'll post those tonight, and I'll send you an email, and I hope, I'm hoping the average is in the 80s, I hope. So I'm just hoping it is. I know it was kind of long, so I think, was, I'm hoping, I think it's going to be my guess, and you can see probably be an 82 or an 83. That's what my guess is. We'll see. I hope I don't have to scale it. First time I did a uh, Scantron exam for anything but a final. So uh, I hope I judged it all right, but if I didn't, then it's on me. Certainly not on you. There's one of me and there's a lot of you. So if you bomb it, it's on me and I have to scale it, right? How could I blame you guys? So we'll see how it goes. I'm curious. So you'll find out tonight. Okay, so now to the lecture. Okay. Just have to get a writing utensil here. All right. Here we go. Okay. So today is what? The day after? It's February 21st. And what are we talking about here? Okay, it's a new part. We're talking about something called analysis of variance. You've probably heard. How many people have heard? Just I have, there's not many here. I love if I can just look at you and talk to you. So how many have heard of analysis of variance? Just raise your hand. Okay. So this is, um, also abbreviated as ANOVA, and we're going to look at it to compare group means. All right? So before, we've tested hypothesis, hypotheses, comparing what? Comparing the averages, the means in two populations. We did what? The two samples, Z tests with big samples, and the T tests, if those conditions, if we didn't know the variance, didn't know sigma and had small samples that were normally distributed. All right? Now, what was the null hypothesis? The usual null was the population means were equal. In our sample, we saw some differences, but in the population, those, they're equal, and that the differences we saw in our samples were just due to chance. Observe difference between the z was equal to the difference between the group means minus the expected of zero, we thought they were the same, over the standard error from for the difference. And t was the same thing under the 
uh, conditions, if those three conditions were met. The most important one is that we didn't know sigma of the population, okay? Now, what we're going to do is we want to compare, what are we going to do if we want to compare three means, three group means? We can't just say, we don't have one number, the difference between two. We have three. We can't boil down the differences between those three groups into a, or more groups into a single signed number. So what do you think we do? Doesn't this sound familiar by now? We square the differences, right? We can't boil them down to a single number because some are positive and some are negative. So we square the differences and sum them. And this gives us a test that's the ratio of two variances called the F ratio. It's very similar to what we did with the chi-squared, right? Um, remember, before we used the chi-squared test for independence to compare three or more groups on some categorical variable. And then we said, OK, it's kind of an extension of the two sample z to three or more samples, two or more samples. And we said that, OK. And we saw that the chi-squared distribution for just, in this case, when you just have two groups, is z squared. All right, now we're going to do the same thing with the f. Now we're going to use the f to compare three or more groups on some quantitative variable. So it's a quantitative variable. It's, a, you're, it's like a variable, um, you know, you answer with a number. If it was a question on our survey, it would be you answer with a number. And this one would be you answer yes or no. So if I asked you something like, do you ever fall asleep? In, have you ever fallen asleep in class? If the answer is yes or no, that would be the category var categorical variable. And if I wanted to compare something like um, year in school, do freshmen fall asleep more than sophomores? Or sophomores more, as you get older, you probably get sleepier, maybe. So this, I'd do the chi-squared test right here. But what if I asked you how many times you fell asleep in class? Then you couldn't do these chi this, this chi-squared test for independence. And you'd have to use um, this F ratio, because you're going to be comparing group means, means, not just counts. All right? So the F compares the differences between the groups to differences within. All right. I'm going to just, I'm just going to do an example, that, ex that example I just said. So what did we do? So before we said, OK, so the chi-squared, this is what we've done before, the chi-squared independence is used what? To compare two or more groups, OK? Like year in school would be a group, two or more groups. It's some categorical variable. That's one of the variables, two or more groups. On a, another categorical variable, two. Compare two or more groups. Well, no, two or more groups on some categorical variable. Like, um, did you fall asleep or not? OK? Or um, did you fall asleep? Yes, no, and maybe. So year in school, falling asleep. Right? Let's write that down. So have you ever fallen asleep in class? Let me look out there. Nobody's asleep so far. OK, have you ever fallen asleep in class? OK, what we're doing with this chi-square independence is basically we have these two variables. We have year in school, so we could have freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors, right? And then we have, we're looking at some categorical variable here. Like, it could be yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. But we could also have maybe, I'm unsure. I don't know, I was asleep. I don't know if I fell asleep. Yes, no, or maybe, OK? Yes, no, or maybe. It could have a lot of categories, right? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, no, maybe. All right? So here we have these two variables, and they're both categorical. One is this variable right here. You can think of it as one variable. 
Actually, it's, it's like the x variable. Can I predict from whether you're a year in school your answers to this question? And this is traditionally the y variable. You know, from your answer, from whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior, can I predict? Can I make a predictive model predicting your answers to some quantitative variable? That's to come. ANOVA, this is going to be ANOVA, is where we're going, is also used for regression, predictive modeling. Okay? So anyway, so that we have these two variables, and they're both categorical. That is the point. This is group membership. This is, they're both categorical variables. This is your group that you're in. And this is your, the answer to the question. And that is also categorical, so your answer. another variable, and they're both categorical. Now in ANOVA, this one's going to be categorical, but this one's going to be quantitative. So let's think what, what we're doing here. I just want you to get a big picture of why we're even doing this stuff, why, why we're going to have different statistics and what they look like. We're going, toward, we're going to have another hypothesis uh, test statistic called the F, and we're going to look at the F distribution. So I want to motivate why we're doing that. OK, so before we looked at a chi-squared, and we said our H naught, our null hypothesis was what? That the two variables are independent, these two, that knowing one, is, it's not, knowing one tells you nothing about the other. So if we were trying to predict answers based on this, we'd get slopes of 0, nothing. You can't make, it's not going to be any more helpful. This doesn't tell us anything about these answers. That's a no. What's another way of saying that? That the percent composition, right, in each group, in each one of these years, is what? The null is always that there's no differences, that they're what? Is the same. Right? That's when we do that table. And we get the percent composition. Each one of those is the same. That's what you're doing when you take the row total times the column total over the overall total. You're just saying those percent compositions in each one of your categories is the same. That's your null. Right? And your alternative is no. Mm -mm. They're not the same. Knowing something about, knowing somebody's year is going to tell me something about Maybe just a little bit, but it's going to tell me beyond chance something about their answers. Like, for example, my hypothesis would be these upperclassmen are going to fall asleep more. They're more bored. They're getting on with their life. It's not an exciting thing to be in a lecture anymore. You know? So these guys, that would be my prediction. So and I would test it with this. Do you get it? Do you understand so far? Not or yes? Yes or no? OK. So they're not the same. Percent composition in each group is not the same. All right, this is what we've done before. Now, we're going to do something different. OK, so now, what are we going to do? So now we're going to use ANOVA. OK, so what now? ANOVA now will use analysis of variance, and not the chi-square test, but something called the F ratio, or the F stat, the F ratio, it's the ratio of two variances. The F statistic, that's a test statistic, and we're going to use an F distribution to compare two or more groups, it's still that categorical X, two or more groups on a numerical variable on a quantitative numerical variable. And that would be our y. We're going to be predict. So what would it look like? Instead of asking, how many have you ever fallen asleep? A yes, no question, yes, no, maybe categories. We could ask, how many times? have you fallen asleep in class? OK, 
Okay? And then we'd do the same thing. We'd have the freshmen, the sophomores, the juniors, and the senior boxes. Why boxes? What are we doing here? We're trying, this is the population. These boxes represent the population. And we're, the idea is there's an imaginary, there's a population out there, we're drawing a random sample. Yes, in our sample we see differences between these, but they're not, they're too small to reflect real difference in the population. So now what are we comparing? We don't have, count, what we have here, we have people are answering how many hours? So it's from zero to, not how many hours, that would have been a quantitative one too, but how many times? So it's from zero to any, you know, 100 maybe. How many times have you fallen asleep in class? And these right inside here is what is it? It's an average, and I'm going to say mu because it's the average of the population. The mean. Mu, mean. It's an M, Greek M, mu, mean. Okay, so there we go. Now, so what is this, do you think? What do you think H naught is? H naught before was what? The percent in each group is the same. Now we're just going to say what? The mu's, the means. The mu's in each group is what? The same. And H alternative again is that the mu's in each group, not that they're all different, like these don't all have to be different, just at least one of them's different. They're not all the same, right? So they don't, not all the same, right? They don't all have to be different from each other. Three of them can be the same and one can be different, okay? The mu's in each group is that they're not all the same, that at least one is different, it's the same thing. Not quite the same thing, but you know. They're not all equal. Okay, so now, um, I should tell you something else. These sigmas also, are, these sigmas are unknown. Sigma, it's an SD, the, um, you know, the Greek for S, SD. These sigmas um, are unknown, so. They're unknown, so this is why it's kind of like a T. We're going to have to deal with degrees of freedom here for the sample n minus 1. We're going to have to do that. So it's like an extension of the T to more um, groups. All right, in fact, when you just have two groups, you could use either ANOVA or the two sample T, and the T squared is the F. All right, but that's... So what else should I say here? Um, basically, this is the idea that, so what do we have here? Again, what do we have? We have this is our x, you can think of it, predicting some y. And this is a categorical variable, the group membership, right? Group, let's write it the same way. It's categorical. But now we're predicting the answer, which is the y, which is our answer, and it's a num numerical answer, so it's a quantitative variable. So you, let's just think about it this way. Hmm. Well, this is enough for now. Let's just get to, so in both cases, I'll just tell you, um, if later we're going to use this ANOVA to do, linear, to do all linear models, so even, um, so right now, this is a special case of it, where we have a categorical uh, x variable predicting a quantitative y here. We could have a quantitative x predicting it, but basically we have this predictive model here. And what I, if you told me if I knew what year you're in, we're, trying, we're saying, does that tell us anything about the means? It's like stereotyping. If I know what group you're in, can I somehow stereotype that and ha have some meaningful prediction about some quantitative variable? It's kind of like that. That's what this is. All right, so that's the difference. And so let's now look at what we're doing here. So 
what we are doing is we're going to compare the variance. OK, so we're going to take this total variability of the y's, these y variables here, the y, what we're, the quantitative variable here. We're taking the total variability of that. What do I mean? It's not quite the variance. Why is it not quite the variance? It's called the sum of squares total. What are we doing? We're taking each little y, each, let's say we had nine data points, OK, in our sample. And we're taking each one of them, divided into groups. We're taking each one of them, and we're subtracting off the mean of them, right? And taking those deviations. But the deviations, if we didn't square them, would sum to 0. That was on the exam, right? They'll sum to 0. So what did we do? We have to square them and then sum them up. And usually, this, so that's the beginning of finding a standard deviation, right? We take the deviations, that's without this, for all of them, for all nine points. Then we, for each one of the nine points, we subtract off the average. That's what taking the deviations is. And then we square them and we sum them up. But then, to get the variance, we would what? Divide, we'd get the average by n. And then to get the square root, we take the square root. So this is like before, this is like one of the first steps before, on the way to getting a standard deviation. That's what I say here. I say this, right? The standard deviation is what? So remember, like, so the variance, maybe this will help. The variance of y is equal to all the sum of those squared deviations, right? That's called the sum of squares total over n. So what you're seeing right here, the sum of squares total, and then of course if you take the square root of it, that's your SD. But then if you multiplied both sides by n here, this n times the variance, this is the variance of y, is equal to the sum of squares total. So it's not quite the variance, it's the variability, we'll call it. It's the sum of the squares. That's what it is. OK, do you understand that? Why do we even care about that? We're trying to predict something, so we're wondering how much they vary. If I wanted to predict your exam scores on the basis of what section you're in, if there was no variability, if you all got the same exam scores, why would I predict anything? So the more these are spread out, you know, you want to know why. That's what we're trying to do. Why? Is it some due to some group membership? Like maybe what section you were in? Or is it just due to chance? So we're kind of splitting it up into the model, you know, the group means, and just the error. OK? But I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're splitting it up into what? The sum of squares between the group means. So this y bar right here, y is an observed value of y, right? So now what is this single bar? This double bar right here is the overall mean. It's called the grand mean. So you lump, put all the groups together, and you get some mean. Now this right here is the mean, is the group mean. So whatever group you're in, if you're, let's say, the group, you know, whatever group you're in, this is the mean of that group. So that's the group mean. So, you have the, so now what are we doing? We're looking at how the group means vary, how different they are. So we're saying we're looking at how this is the average, right? This is the, this is the average of everybody. And how much above or below, how far away each group is from the overall average. This, we're looking at how far away each individual is from the overall average. And now what's this? This is called the sum of squares within the groups. So now this is like how much spread there is within the group. So let's look what this means. So this is just this y. And usually you'd have an individual, like you'd see it with a subscript, like y sub i. And you go from i is equal to 1, the first, all the way up to, if there are 9 in the whole sample, putting all the groups together, it would be that, all the way up to your sample size. OK? And that's what these are. So now you take it e each little individual y observation. So let's say this is an individual, an individual y. 
I just realized there's a lot of notation. And this also is an individual y. So here, when we do the sum of squares total, what are we doing? We're taking a little individual y and subtracting it from the overall mean. But here, this is the within group spread, we're seeing how far the individual y's differ from their group. OK? I think we should do an example. I don't want to lose you. I've already spent a half hour with just the concepts. Now let's just go do an example. I think you'll understand it better. So we'll go back, OK? So here's an example. All right, two experiments were done to compare three weight loss drugs. So we have these three groups. So we're comparing, usually we compare treatment to control. Here we're comparing, this happens all the time, like three different drugs. Or you might have two different drugs and a placebo. But we're comparing three groups here. That's what we're doing. This is really common because lots of times you want to compare two drugs and then you want to comp compare it to a placebo or something like that. So let's just say we have three drugs, right? And then in each experiment, we had just three subjects. It's a very small sample because I want us to go through all the math and not have to. So we have a very small three subjects were randomly assigned to each of the three drugs. So that means we're going to have a n equals 9 then. We're going to have 9, n equals 9, 9 subjects total, right? Split evenly between the three groups. All right. And now what does the numbers indicate the weight in pounds gained or lost after two weeks? So let's just focus on this first experiment. And then these were, let's just look at this one first. OK, so what is this saying? So this is group A. They were given one drug. And they're at, oh, they gained weight. Not a good drug. <laughs> they gained a pound. What is this right here? That's our overall average. That means the average of the nine, the average, it's equal in this case, the average of the nine subjects. So their overall average, I just I made this example up. I just wanted to make it easy. These nine averaged out to zero. That's unusual. I just did it to make our calculations easy. Okay? And so you could see. So this drug really wasn't very good. They gained a pound. Here they on average they gained two pounds. So these are the pounds gained or lost. And there were three people in this group. That's the second group. And the third group. They lost. So this is negative 3. This is the group means 2 and 1. Those are our group means. And these three lost 3 pounds. So this drug, that's why the average is way down here. All right? Now, what does this axis mean? Nothing. I just wanted you to set. This is not a quantitative axis. This is, like a, this is just the three groups. I could have put them all together. But I just wanted you to, there's no numbers on here. This is just like a bar graph or something. This is just for group A group. I could have put them all together. But then you wouldn't have been able to see it as clearly. There's nothing on there. OK? This is, these are it's just categorical variables you don't have an access for. So that's what we have here. Now let's go over to this experiment. So we have two separate experiments, all right? And I just want, this is a cons all right, so now in this experiment, I deliberately made the group means the same. OK, so group A, what people who took group A have the same mean of 1, but they're much more spread out. They have a much bigger sum of squares within the group. Look at those spread out. One's way up here at 6 pounds, one's way down here at negative 4. And they're even more spread out because the, look at the axis here. If this went. This is compressed to fit it in this space here. If I like really made it similar to that one, this would be four. They'd be way spread out. Okay. And now here's the second one is the same, and the third one. 
But again, they have huge within group variation. All right? And they have the same between group variation. What is the between group variation? Remember what it was, the between group variation? It's you take each mean, basically we can represent, and we see the distance from the overall, right? Isn't that what it is? The group, what I'm saying is this. Your group mean minus the overall mean. That distance, I just want, before we, I just want to show you what it looks like here. It's that distance. And it should be the same here as well. I just, if we drew the same to the same scale, but I'll do it here. So it's this, this, and this. So these are supposed to be the same length. Well, you're going to compare the ratio of that to the within group. The within group is what? Each little individual in the group minus its group mean. So we're looking at these differences. These little differences here, these little differences here, and these. As opposed to this, look at this spread. See? And what that we're going to be doing, I'm sorry that this bled through, ignore that. But what we're going to be doing is we're comparing the within group, the between groups, these blue, to the yellow. So we're going to come up with a statistic that basically is the F, that's the ratio of the between group, the blue, over the yellow. Now, both have the same group means. Which experiment do you think provides stronger evidence that one of the drugs is different? Can you see that this one provides much stronger evidence? The people are, the people, look at this, the people are all clustered together. So this is much stronger evidence than this. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so let's write that down. So why? It's experiment one. Why? Because within this within group, the error around our group means So we've got the same means, think about it, but we've got much more error around it. So our group membership doesn't tell us as much here. Okay, so now we're going to compute these. So this is, we're just doing it for this experiment, and this right here is the sum of squares within, so it's going to be smaller, and here's the sum of squares between. So let's just do the calculation for these points, and we're going to uh, work it all out here. This takes a while, but they're easy numbers. Okay, so let's look at the sum of squares total. You should note you take all the numbers, and from all the numbers, we're going to subtract off the grand mean. Okay, so let's start here. 1.5, let's say that's our first subject, minus 0. And then we're going to square it. And then our second subject, minus 0. And our third subject, minus 0. This is just deviations from the average for all nine points squared. Okay, so then we can say 2.5 minus 0 squared, 2 minus 0 squared, and 1.5 minus 0 squared. And now these, we have negative 2.5 minus 0 squared, negative 3 minus 0 squared, and negative 3.5 minus 0 squared. I know I don't have to put the 0 in, but just usually, because if it, it was, you know, just to remind you, and look, I forgot it right there. That's supposed to be a minus 0. Okay? It's just because it's not always 0, the grand mean. All right, and so then you square all these, so you get 2.25, 1 minus 0 squared is 1, etc. And then you can add them all up. And when you do that, I got 43.25. All right? 
And that, if I wanted to go ahead and compute the standard deviation, what would I do? I'd divide this by what? Nine, wouldn't I? Wouldn't I? And then I'd take the square root. That would be our standard deviation of all the points. Does everybody understand so far? All right, so we got that down. And I'm sorry I made it kind of messy. Well, I'll try to be neater. All right, the next one, what are we doing here? These are these blue distances. So you do it for every point, for each one. It's from i is equal to 1 to 9 in this case. So we're going to get nine sums for each of them because we have nine points. OK, so we're going to take these same points. So we have 1.5. But instead of minus, oops, yeah, instead of minus 1, what are you going to, Instead of minus 0, we're going to say minus its group mean. See that? And the next one, what are we going to do? Oops, look what I just did. Sorry, I'm computing the wrong one. I was thinking about something else. This, I, I'm doing this one. Do you realize that? OK, let's start over. What am I doing? I'm taking this group mean. Let's look at that. The group mean. What is the group mean for that group? What is it? All th what is the group mean? One. So it's one. That has a group mean of one, right? And what am I doing for all nine points? So, so I'm saying for this point, the way you can think of it, for this guy, oops, so for this first person in the group, you can say, what's his group, what his, his or her group mean? It's one. So you don't focus on the individual point here. You focus on the individual point's group mean. So you say, OK, person subject one is in a group that has mean one, the group, it's group, so he is one. And then we're minusing not one, but the overall. Which is, this is all going to be the same. See, minus the overall. So this whole column is going to be zeros. This whole column, you're going to have 9 minus zeros. You won't get so... Con so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 of these. They're all minus 0. And they're all going to be squared. So they're all minus 0, and they're all squared. That's a good way so you don't lose track. All right, so now what are these? These are, for these three people, they all share the same group mean, which is 1. So these will all be 1. What do you think the next group? Let's do the next group. For the people in the next group, they all share what group mean? What, is it, what do you think goes in here? Their group mean is what? Two. And for the three people in the next group, their group mean is what? It's right here. Negative three. Does that make sense? So what we're doing is for this group, we're taking this distance of 1 from the average. For this group, we're taking this distance of 2 from the average. And for this group, we're taking a difference of negative 3 to the average. Negative 3 from the average. And so do you see how 1 plus 2 minus 3 just sums to 0? And so that's why we have to square these differences, because we just get 0. OK? So we'll square them. And this is easy to do. We square them, we get 1, 1, 1. Here we get 2 squared, so we get 4, 4, and 4. And here we get 9 squared, 3 squared. So we get 9, 9, and 9. And those total to what? Is that right? Those total to 42. OK. And now, what are we doing? So any questions so far? 
There's a lot of calculations. Aren't you glad I didn't give you more people in each group? This gets very tedious. Now, maybe we should proceed the same way. Let's see the next one. So the next one is what? Let's look. One. So for all of them, we're going to be subtracting off the group mean here. So for the first three, we're going to be subtracting off 1. That's the group mean here. For the next three, we're going to be subtracting off what? 2. This way I won't make a mistake. And for the next three, what are we going to be subtracting off? It's group mean, which is what? We're going to be subtracting off negative 3. So I'm just going to say that's the same as adding 3. All right. So now what are we going to do? This is for all nine points. So let's start with our first one. So this is y. So we have 1.5 is subject 1. Subject 2 is right at its group mean. It made, so it's exactly at the mean. And this is 0 0.5. And these are all squared. And you see how, like with in each group, they sum to 0? The deviations around their own group mean. One, Point 0.5, 0, and negative point 0.5. OK? They, those deviations would sum to 0. And now we'll do the next one. And so we have what for the next one? 2.5, 2, and 1.5. And for the last one, we have negative 2.5, negative 3, and negative 3.5. And these are all squared. Now, remember this, what we're saying is that we can break up this total variability of the y's into two pieces. So let's check. So this is 42, and this, I didn't do it, but it's, I know it's going to sum to 1.5. But you should check and see that it does. So the idea is you can break up this total variability of the y into two pieces. Where did the what come from? 42 plus 1.5. 1.25. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. OK. That's great. Thank you. Any questions? OK. 42 plus, I, you can do it and check. Any other questions? All right, so now, 1.25. Great, unless this is 43 point, shoot. This might be 43.5, because I just wrote this down. I, this is right, I bet. I bet this is this, but I bet this one is 43.5. Yes, that's the, that's the mistake. This actually is 43.5. I was just copying them down instead of adding them. Thank you for catching that. That's how it goes. We are lazy. We should be adding these up. But do you really want me to do that? No. OK. We're a team. Thank you. It's so easy to make these mistakes. Now. So what are we going to do now? We are going to do this F ratio, which is going to be basically the ratio of what? This sum of squares between divided by the, its degrees of freedom over this one divided by its degrees of freedom. So let's move on. And we're going to do something, an ANOVA table here. So this ANOVA table is a handy way to illustrate how the sum of squares are partitioned. We're partitioning the variability of the y into that which is due to the group membership and that which is due to the error within the group membership, error around it. Basically, the model and the error. OK, so fill in the table for experiment one using calculations. All right, so what do we have? So we have that 40, this is 43.5. Okay, 
This was 1.5 from the previous page, and this was 42. They sum. Now the degrees of freedom, those pesky little degrees of freedom, how are you going to remember this? Well, you already know this n minus 1 is just our usual. When you have a list of numbers and you know the average, right, the deviations around that have to sum to 0. So n minus 1 of them are free to vary. So in this case, it's 9 minus 1, which is 8. Now, what about these degrees of freedom? Maybe if I, we go back here, it will help us. The first one is g minus 1, 4 minus 1, which is 3. And this one is 9n minus the number of groups. Wait a minute. How many, how many groups do we have? We only have three groups. I'm looking at our previous. I was going to explain it to you by thus, so I'm looking here. But we are on this example. How many groups do we have? Three. So we have 3 minus 1, which is 2. And we have 9 minus 3, which is 6. So 2 plus 6 adds to 8. So the number of degrees of freedom total the same way the sum of squares total. But why? I think it's easiest to explain it. Let's just explain it here. So you have degrees of freedom for both variables, right? For the group variable, for the group variable, you have a degrees of freedom. Why? Just like you did for chi-square, chi the number of categories minus 1, right? The number of groups. Because if I told you what the um, average of each group was, the, the last one would be determined. Now, why? So there's only really three that are free to vary. So that's the group. So this degrees of freedom right here is, would be the number of groups minus 1. All right? Now we have not inside each of these groups, we have numerical data. Numerical data. So why? Let's think about it. Which, within each one, we are looking at variability around its mean. Its mean. Right? That's what we did. So this, the deviations within each group have to sum to, to 0. So we have n minus 1 degrees of freedom within here. If I told you 2 of the deviations, you'd know the last one. So you have n minus 1 here however many people are in each group, n minus 1 here, n minus 1 here, and n minus 1 here, which is n minus g. And that's why together they add up to n minus 1. Basically, it's the number of um, things, number of independent estimates that go into your calculations. So we have, for this group, if it had 10 people in it, we only have nine independent estimates, because if I once you know, once we've already estimated this, once we know this, we know the last one. Same with this, same with this, and same with this. And now, if we know these group averages, the last one is determined. Because altogether, they have to equal the average of the whole thing. And the group differences are going to sum to 0. So if you know three of them, the last one's determined. Just like we did that. We said, OK, 1, 2, and negative 3. If I gave you two of them, the last one's determined. It has to sum to 0. These are deviations around some parameter that we already figured out. So that's why these, deg these degrees of freedom are the way they are. OK? Now, why didn't we have degrees of freedom with a? What was the chi-square? Let's write this down maybe while we're on it. I get excited about explaining this stuff, and I hope I'm not getting too ahead of myself. We're going to go. This is going to be the rest of the course for a huge amount of it on regression. It's the same stuff. So let me just give you a, So for here, we have this chi-square statistic. And what its degrees of freedom only depend on the number of categories minus 1. It doesn't matter how many, what our sample size is. It's just the number of categories minus 1. When we have independence, it's the number of categories of one variable minus 1 times the next one. 
but it doesn't depend on n. We are not making an estimation of these sigmas. That's because in this, because why? Because basically we have proportions here. And basically, like in the two samples, zero, one box. So we don't have, we don't have these, we're not making an estimate of the sigmas here. We are here. We're making an estimate of the population sigmas from our sample. That's what we're doing. So for each, just like we do with the t-test. So we have two sets of degrees of freedom. We have the same one. We have the same one that we have here, the number of categories, the number of groups minus one, the same one for the chi-square. And then we also have the other one that depends on how many, your, the size of your sample. So this is like, each little one of these is like a t. So this is n minus one, this is n minus one, this is n minus one, and this is n minus one. So together they're n minus g. Does that make sense? I mean, n minus one for this group, like the number of people in here, the number of people in here, the number. So all together, it's a, you got it? Okay. It doesn't matter if you do. You're going to hear this over and over and over again. So you're going to learn it by the end. All right. So that's where this comes from, these degrees of freedom. So you know this one already. So if you and just figure out one of them and you know that they have to sum. Same with this. If you give you any one of these, the other two you can um, any two of these, the other one you can figure out. Any two of these, the other one you can figure out. Now what are we doing here? Basically, we're just looking at these sum of squares and we're dividing it by their degrees of freedom here, right? So for this one, we have the 42 divided by 2. And here, we have the sum of squares, which is what, 1.5 divided by 6. Whoa. So this is 21, and this is what? 0 0.25, right? Is that right? All right. So now, what is our F ratio. I said it's the ratio of basically the between to the within, your model sort of to your error, the group membership to this, but it's actually after you average it. This is like an average, the mean square between, the mean square within. So finally, we get 21 over 0 0.25, which is 84. A huge, massive, massive statistic, test statistic. It's enormous, okay? And what does it mean? So let's go look over here on the next page and look at an F table. Okay, so here's an F table on the next page. And what are we doing here? So these are the group degrees of freedom here. And right here is the error degrees of freedom. So what are we going to look at? So for the group degrees of freedom, we had two. For the error degrees of freedom, what did we have? On the other page, six. Was it six? Error degrees of freedom are six. So you go two and six, and here's the critical value. 5.143 is the critical value of F at 5%. These are hard to look at because they're many pages long because this is just for significance level 5%. So what does that mean? Let's look down here. Let's mark, what did we get? We got a chi-square of, I mean, not a chi-square, an F ratio of 84. That's our test statistic. And the F's always positive. And here is, right here, is our critical value, F star equal to 5.143. And the way we usually write this is you write the degrees of freedom. So you'd say the critical value for what? Um, 2 in the numerator and 6. Because every F curve is going to look different. They're all positive because 
the, the ratio of two squares, they're all positive. Now we got 84, so we have to see, remember this is 5%. That's because of the 5% right here. So this is 5%. So we said if it's five, if the probability of getting this statistic just by the luck of the draw is, so, is less than 5%, we'll reject the null. So we can't, 84 is so far, it's off the charts. It's so far. So 84 is like, let's just pretend it's there. But it's even off the charts. So our p-value is minute, minute. So our f stat is so much bigger, so much bigger. It's just way, way, way bigger than the critical value of f at for this particular curve. It's so much bigger than what five point. This is so much bigger. So let's just write it this way. So our F stat was 84. It's so much bigger than this one, which is 5.143. So what does that mean? So our, so our P value is what? Way, 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 way smaller than 5%. We can't even, it's just tiny. So we reject the null big time, hugely and conclude that those groups are different. Okay, does that make sense? Maybe, let's write it down here. What is this F ratio? So the F ratio is equal to the mean square between over the mean square within. And the between was massive compared to the within in our picture. When the null is true, it's, it's about one. When the null is true, that ratio would be about one because they're both estimates of the overall variance. When the null is true, there's no more reason that one group would be any more like the other. So that um, distances between groups would be the same, spread between, between groups would be the spread within groups, and they'd both be estimates of this variance. So let's... Under the null of no difference between the groups, we expect the ratio to be about one. Why? Think of it this way. The null treats all nine observations as coming from the same group. Let's push them all into the same group right here, right? Put them all in the same group, shuffle them up, and then divide them into three groups. This would be so unusual. Okay, imagine putting the nine tickets in a box, shaking them up, and then randomly dividing them into three groups. The means of the three groups would differ by the luck of the draw, and all individual responses would be governed by the same laws of chance having nothing to do with group membership. So there's no reason individuals in the same group would be any more like each other than they are individuals in different groups. So this is the reasoning behind it. So when the null is true, that's what we do when we normalize these things. We basically are normalizing these by dividing by different numbers here so that we're adjusting for the group size and the samples sizes here. Once you do that, they're basically estimates of the same, they're estimates of the same of SST. And if they're, so they should be about the same under the null. When, when group membership doesn't mean anything, when it's just random. The null is they were, the three membership in those groups was just randomly assigned. Okay? And they shouldn't be any different from each other than so if the statistic is larger than one, we'll reject the null. How much larger? How much larger depends on the number of degrees of freedom, okay? So if our F statistic is bigger than one, we can look at the F distribution. We just did that and see how far out on the tail it is. This was just astronomical. I made up this example, but it's astronomically out on the tail. And the area of the tail is called the p-value and gives us the likelihood of seeing such an extreme F or more extreme if those groups were just, ra those people were just randomly assigned to the groups, which they were. So if the, dr if the drugs were all the same. So if P is very small, we reject the null and conclude that all the means are not the same in the population. And then looking at the F isn't easy, because why? There are different F curves 
depending on those two sets of degrees of freedom. And so it makes the f really annoying and many, many pages long, which is why it's way better to do this. Why don't we just do it and see what we get? OK, it's way better to go to our p-value calculator and the f distribution. OK, so we had the degrees of freedom in the numerator of 2 and the denominator of 6. And we're going to compute our p-value for what? What did we get? We got a um, f of 84. So there's our p-value. But if we had lots of um, groups, like let's just say 100 groups, well, that's really a lot. Let's say our degrees of freedom was, I don't know, 1,000 or something. Well, whatever. Now let's compute the p-value. And now you see it looks much more normal. As your number of groups, as, as your samples are bigger, and look where it's centered, right at 1. Just like the normal curve centered at 0, the thing I love about the f is it's centered at 1. That it's even centered. It's centered only when it, becomes symmet when it becomes symmetrical. The mean is still 1. Let me show you. In our really asymmetrical, what was it, 2, and then we had... Whoops. Degrees of freedom, 6. I know you're probably bored, but I like this stuff, 6. OK, and now we're going to compute the p-value. OK. It's really asymmetrical, but the mean is still 1. The expect is still about 1. So look how far we are. What do I mean the mean? I mean, if you did this over and over and over again, this is the sampling distribution of that F statistic under the null. OK. Any questions? So let's go back to the document camera. And let's see what else we want to do. So let's answer our question. So experiment 2 and this, what does it say? Experiment 2 and they have the same, boy group means. The two experiments have the same group means, but much larger within group spread. So which experiment has a larger F ratio? Well, which one do you think? What are they saying here? That the mean, they're saying that MSB is same for two ex Okay, so MSB is the same for the two experiments. We have the same group means, but MSW is smaller for experiment one. So we have this, so our F ratio, this one you're going to do for homework, experiment two. So our F ratio, you're going to get, when you do the next, it's, I'll put it on the homework, you'll do experiment two. So you should be getting an F, you'll get the, you should be getting the same here. So this is the same for both experiments. Oh, why is this happening to me? All right, let's just see if I can figure out what I'm doing. I'm really sorry. Oh, there, I did it. OK. And now the lamp. OK, so this is the same for two, the two experiments. Same for both experiments. But this, remember, is really different. And what is it? It's much smaller for experiment one. That's what I'm saying. 
So this is much smaller for experiment one. So the F ratio will be much bigger for experiment one. So you're not going to get 84 when you do the homework for, your, for that other experiment. So F ratio is much bigger for experiment one. OK? The yellow is much bigger. Those, the yellow one. OK, so now, and these are supposed to be the same. Are we almost done? Let's see. 